afternoon. On behalf of Dr. Joyce Walker, our director, who could not be with us today, thank you for joining us for this special Humanity Center event. Thank you also to the Everett Community College Foundation for its ongoing support of the humanities. At this time, I'd like to ask you to silence any electronic devices that might disrupt the lecture today. Also, I'd like to remind you that if you need to leave early, please do so by the back door. Our speaker today is Andrew Tatey. Dr. Tatey is an associate professor of English at Seattle University. He earned a doctorate of philosophy degree in English from St. Louis University, where he specialized in Renaissance, 19th, and 20th century literature. He has been awarded nine postdoctoral fellowships and scholarships, including two Andrew Mellon Foundation fellowships. Dr. Tatey is the founder and director of the Faith and Great Ideas program at Seattle University, the founder of the Seattle University Marksmanship Club, and the founding director of the Seattle G.K. Chesterton Society. He has worked for many years as a faculty associate and an honors program mentor for the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. For the past three years, he has served as a curriculum consultant for a soon-to-be-established college in Mount Kara, Illinois, called St. Athanasius College. Dr. Tatey is the co-editor of two volumes of essays, which will shortly be available in our library, Permanent Things Toward the Recovery of a More Human Scale at the End of the 20th Century, and G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis, The Riddle of Joy, both published by Erdman's. More recently, he has published journal articles on Washington State Public Higher Education Core Curricula and on Aristotle's Poetics. He is also a dahlia and rose grower and a cabinet maker. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Tatey. Thank you for those kind remarks. I had no idea that uh, you discovered that uh, I'm interested in cabinet making and growing dahlias and roses. <laughs> and you did mention that I'm the faculty moderator for the Seattle University Marksmanship Club. Not very often that uh, growing flowers and shooting rifles, pistols, and shotguns go together, but in this case they do. I want to thank uh, Jeffrey Pierce very sincerely and for uh, Dr. Joyce Walker for inviting me to speak with you today, and as I was sitting at the side observing uh, this gathering, I was uh, very pleased. Here you are between classes, and uh, between classes, as you come into a classroom and sit, you are far more lively than my students, or I think students in general are at Seattle University. I'm going to count on that, as you'll see in a few minutes. Um, at the end of my remarks, I hope to generate uh, discussion based on two questions that I'll tell you about in, in just a little while. I should say, too, that it's a real privilege to have been invited to Everett Community College. This is my first time on campus, and I'm just amazed at how large and complex uh, this institution is. Uh, it's really uh, quite some, some place, uh, very, very striking place to me, uh, where you've come to be educated. The topic under discussion today, literature and liberal education, is a troublesome one because neither term as commonly used has a clear and distinct meaning. Of course, people agree that literature is an art, as architecture, dance, music, and sculpture are arts, and they agree that literature is an art distinguished from other arts, but defining it in a precise way and describing its constituent parts and the general way it achieves its appealing and salutary effects is hotly debated among scholars. Before discussing this topic in detail, though, I want you to, I'm going to ask you to think about two questions 
which I hope all of you will join in a discussion at the very end of my remarks. As we proceed through this address, you'll understand why, I hope you understand why I'm asking these questions. First question, what stories will you want to have told to your children? And the second question is, what stories, if any, will you not want them to know? These questions are, of course, the very same questions that Socrates addresses in Plato's Republic. To help prepare for our discussion of these questions, I want to define our two terms, literature and liberal education. First, liberal education. About the origin of the term, scholars agree that the idea was conceived by the Greeks. For them, it meant an education proper to a free and noble man in contradistinction to slaves and other people engaged in any kind of menial work, and I would say only engaged. Their lives are only engaged, or at least mostly engaged with menial work. To be free in this sense meant to be a person who has the opportunity to enjoy leisure. That is precisely a man or another or a woman not under any compulsion to do servile work. They may do servile work, but they aren't required to do servile work because it's got to be done if they're going to eat. But to have leisure meant primarily dealing with the affairs of state, pursuing political ends, and also pursuing knowledge leading to wisdom. The Greek word for leisure, skole, is significantly the root of our word school. That is, having the privileged time and the opportunity to fulfill that natural, come on in and have a chair, come on in. These are guests, I think, from a local school. I understand you got held up by a bridge that was raised. Welcome to all you newcomers. I, uh, I'm going to recapitulate um, at least briefly. I want you to consider two questions that I hope my remarks today will lead to a discussion. And uh, you're in high school, right? Especially for you high school students, you have to think a few years ahead. Imagine yourself being married with children. And the first question I want you to consider is, what stories will you want told to your children? And the second question is, what stories, if any, will you not want them to know? Now these, these questions, uh, I want you to consider as I make these remarks, but most of my address is going to be dealing with explaining two terms, and they're very difficult to deal with precisely because there's, there's so many different ideas about each of these terms. The title of the address is Literature and Liberal Education, and it's the very word literature and the very term liberal education that's so troublesome. So many people have such different ideas about each of them. It's difficult to 
talk in some precise, meaningful way about them. But I'm going to try to deal with both of them. I'm going to start by dealing with liberal education. And just before you came in, I said that the origin of liberal education had a very clear meaning for the ancient Greeks. That is, it was the kind of education that some few, because of circumstances, were able to receive. And this education was different from a, another kind of education that has to do with becoming skilled in some menial task, some, some kind of physical labor. Now, this doesn't mean that some those people who had a liberal education or were pursuing it wouldn't have lives that dealt with physical things. They, didn't, they could do physical work, but it was a choice. It wasn't simply necessary because they had to earn their living. And as you came in, I mentioned that the Greek word for leisure, having the leisure to pursue this kind of education, that word in Greek is skole, which we now call school. And people who attended this kind of school, received this kind of education, had the opportunity, the time to fulfill a desire to learn, to learn about many, many things. But not to learn just about anything but about those arts necessary for a young person in future years to participate in directing and advancing the common good of his city. Now, here in America, we're a constitutional republic in which uh, citizens are asked to vote on any number of local issues or state matters or federal elections. In the kind of society we have, citizens share in this responsibility to think about how to advance the common good. That is, to think about something beyond, to have a responsibility for something beyond their own personal good. You've got to do two things. As Aristotle stated in his politics, nature herself, as has often been said, requires that we should be able not only to work well, but to use leisure well. What ought we to do when at leisure? Clearly, we ought not to be just amusing ourselves, for, the, for then amusement would be the end of life the purpose of life. It is clear then that there are branches of learning and education which we must study with a view to the enjoyment of leisure and these are to be valued for their own sake. Of the two, for Aristotle, of the two most important employments of leisure time, first, attention given to the political community, the common good. And the second, engaging in the kind of learning and the practicing of those arts which will make you more of a perfect individual human person. Now, among scholars, some consider statecraft to be more important than individual development. And there are scholars that consider, no, You've got to start with the individual and then move to making good judgments about the common good. Jacob Klein says, no one will doubt that the legislator should direct his attention above all to the education of youth. The citizen should be molded to suit the form of government under which he lives. And I think there's some sense to this. Different societies, they're organized in different ways, and it means that the people in those societies tend to look at their lives in some different ways. 
than people in other societies with different kinds of political arrangements and different kinds of social customs. On the other hand, Sir Richard Livingstone considers politics subordinate to perfecting one's own individual virtues. He considers the development of individual persons to be primary, to be the primary end of liberal education. And he says this about the Greeks. The Greeks held that the free man, the real man, must be something more than a mere breadwinner. He must have something besides the knowledge necessary to earn a living. He must have also the education which will give him the chance of developing the gifts and faculties of human nature and becoming a fuller, more perfect human being. Liberal education, he says, helps each individual to become, as far as his capabilities allowed, what a person ought to be. But he asks, then, what is a complete or a more complete human being? And he answers, human beings are complex organisms, having three distinct kinds of capabilities. The physical capabilities of the body, the different mental capabilities of the mind, and the development of one's own character. And each of these is capable of being developed to become more perfect. This is what's meant by that common phrase that one ought to pursue excellence. For a living stone, Excellence means perfecting yourself, not in one way, but in three different ways. The virtue of, he says, the virtue or, ex of, or excellence of the body is health, fitness, and strength of the mind to know and understand and to think, and of the character, the perfection of the great virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance, and magnanimity. Livingstone considers the mastery of any subject can be either liberal or servile. This is, I consider, a very interesting point. For Livingstone and for Aristotle, the matter is not so much, the primary matter is not so much what you study, but your reason for studying it. One can study anything to apply that knowledge, say, to getting a job. Or one can study that same subject, maybe that will help you get a job, but if your intention is that you want to study to perfect your capacity of knowing more about reality, Livingstone considers it's that second intention that applies to liberal education, to have the right intention why you're studying, why you're learning, why you're perfecting yourself. In ancient Rome, two different commentators on the nature of liberal education, Cicero, someone I suppose you do know, and Vitruvius, both agreed that acquiring a liberal education is an essential element but not the end of a good life. Cicero held that merely to possess virtue, to have a being that's very virtuous, is not enough. You have to apply it. And he cites as an example, wise philosophers. Wise philosophers who express, he says, in just and sincere sentiments about so many matters. They merely state in words what has actually been realized and put into effect by those statesmen who have given states their laws. The point of this is that it is good to know and to know about a lot of different things and to know them well. But it is even better to have that knowledge and be able to put it into practice. 
In his dialogue, Cicero's dialogue, his answer to Plato's Republic, Cicero's Republic, he describes a very great general named Scipio, who is not just a general. He is a highly educated, very successful statesman as well. And Cicero in this di uh, Scipio in this dialogue is asked, you know, you've achieved this really high prominent position. You're a very admirable person. How did this happen? What were the reasons? What were the causes? And he answers very quickly. And he starts by talking about his childhood. He said, I was born as a typical Roman citizen, but for a father's care received a liberal education, who has been fired from boyhood with the love of learning, but who nevertheless has gained a far wider training from experience and from a father's precepts than he has derived from the study of books. For Cicero, the good life requires being born into a decent family. Aristotle says the same thing. In which parents give the correct guidance by instilling the highest precepts to their children and then providing them with a formal education. And then finally, and Scipio says this about himself, given the opportunity to put these lessons into practice. The second Roman, Vitruvius, you may not know, he wrote the oldest complete surviving manual on architecture. Uh, years ago I had an honor student of mine who went on to study, uh, become uh, an, an architect, studied architecture, got his master's degree, and he wrote back to me and he said, here I'm taking my first course and I'm reading Vitruvius again. <laughs> Vitruvius has a very high stature in this art of architecture. Vitruvius, though, calls it a science, which in Latin means from sciere, meaning to know, the knowledge of it's necessary for an architect to know. The science of architect depends upon many disciplines and various apprenticeships which are carried out in other arts. So architects who without culture, mastering many disciplines, those, architecture, those architects who, those students of architecture, who without culture aim at manual skill cannot gain prestige according to their labors, while those who trust the theory and literature obviously follow a shadow and not reality. We might call this mere book learning. But those who have mastered both, like men equipped in full armor, soon acquire influence and attain their purpose. The man who is to follow the architectural profession, he says, manifestly needs to have experience of both kinds, theory and practice. Sounds like Cicero again. He must have a natural gift and also the readiness to learn. For neither talent without instruction nor instruction without talent can pr produce the perfect craftsman. Then Vitruvius goes on to list some of the main kinds of studies a student of architecture has to know if he's going to be a good architect. You're going to find this a very strange list, I think. He should be familiar with historical studies, a skillful draftsman, a mathematician, a diligent student of philosophy, acquainted with music, not ignorant of medicine, learned in the responses of juris consults, which means know the law, and be familiar with astronomy and ast astronomical calculations. And then he goes on at length to defend every one of those kinds of studies that an architect has to master if he really wants to be at the top rank. Now, it strikes me that the same thing applies to all professions. If you're really going to achieve the high rank in any profession, 
You can't just know one or two things very well because the, the professions themselves are complex. You have to know a lot of things very well and know also in the practice of a profession how to apply one kind of knowledge in a certain circumstance and another kind of knowledge in another circumstance. But it's all a unity in your own understanding of what is required by the profession at its higher, highest levels. Now I'm going to move from ancient Rome to contemporary times. Several years ago, A.H. Halsey wrote a series of articles published in the London Times Higher Educational <coughs> Supplement. Each of these articles examined a different claim about the best purpose of a university education. You students won't know this, but all you faculty certainly do. What, what kinds of things should go on at a university? Well, there are debates go on and on and on. Halsey, after a series of these essays, wrote his final essay saying, here you've got all this, this whole history of ideas of what a university ought to do. And he said in the end, and there are many scholars who hold the same view, he had defended John Henry Newman's understanding of a university as having the highest purpose of a university. In fact, Newman's idea of a university, written in 1854, is commonly considered the best single volume statement about the subject of a university education that has been written. Newman's analysis is complex, but several aspects of it are pertinent to our considerations today. One of the central aspects of Newman's understanding of liberal education is his belief in the ultimate order within all parts of reality. That is to say, reality itself is enormously complex. It has so many parts. Learning should acquaint us with the parts, each of the parts distinctly, but also, and with equal importance, how one part relates to the other. Think Vitruvius in architecture. You have to have mastered so many disciplines if you're going to be a very good architect. But you have to know how these disciplines fit together into your profession of architecture. Newman puts it this way. All branches of knowledge are connected together because the subject matter of knowledge is in intimately united in itself. Hence it is that the sciences into which our knowledge may be said to be cast have multiplied bearings on one another and an internal sympathy and admit or rather demand comparison and adjustment. What does this have to do with your education? It is certainly essential that you master discrete disciplines. But that itself is not sufficient. Along with the mastery of discrete disciplines that you come to understand how the various disciplines are woven together into a fabric. And the fabric will give us an understanding of how reality is actually constituted. Newman goes on to say that it's a mistake for a college or a university to give undue prominence to any single discipline because it would distort the understanding of how the parts of reality are woven together. Newman in describing someone who's completed a liberal education this way. He apprehends the great outlines of knowledge, the principles on which it rests, the scale of its parts, its lights and its shades, its great points and its little, as he otherwise cannot apprehend them. Hence, it is that his education is called liberal. 
It might be said that Newman believed that a liberal education shall make you free. Free from small-mindedness, free to pursue what your intellect desires, free to have a more complete understanding of what is real as distinguished from what only seems to be real at the time. Peter Kalkavich of St. John's University in Annapolis describes Newman's sense of the importance of studying each discipline in relation to the others by means of a striking metaphor. He's comparing, pursuing a liberal education to music. He looks at the study of the liberal arts like a musical composition. The music of the liberal arts, rather than as a fine art, get students to look beyond surface distinctions in order to seek out deep underlying harmonies or bonds between things remote, apparently remote. And when you think about music in its parts and you look at just one part, all you're getting is just one note, one sound. Not much of a song. You just look at musical notes one after the other but not related with the other, you don't have one song. The power comes from having all the notes composed in a harmony. And if it's done well, it's something we can all enjoy. Interestingly, Socrates said the same thing. He called philosophy the greatest music. If Newman sees the benefit of a liberal education as a means of approaching truth, Calcavage uh, sees it satisfying another kind of desire, the recognition and appreciation of the beauty, the beauty of reality when considered wholly. Both men, however, relate liberal education to a third great transcendental. In addition to being a means of seeking truth and recognizing the beauty of reality, a liberal education also deepens one's understanding of the good, what is good. Both Newman and Calcavage describe certain habits or behavior, all often cultivated by a liberal arts education. Newman lists some of the chief attributes that simply, it's not the purpose of the education, but it's sort of what you get incidentally. And it's common when you think about people you know who are really very well educated. Commonly, these attributes Newman lists freedom, equitableness, treating everything fairly according to what the thing desires, calmness, moderation, and wisdom. Kalikovich describes another important good habit inculcated during the process of being liberally educated, the ability to engage in extended, serious conversation about controversial issues. As he says, learning is not confined to the classroom, to exams or formally scheduled meetings like this one, but pervades all aspects of college life. Talk about ideas goes on all the time, everywhere. That's why I was so pleased when I made my first remarks to see while we were waiting for this gathering to begin, uh, we were just chatting away very, very actively. It's the kind of thing that Kalikovic sees as very good, this kind of activity that should go on at a university. These are the virtues that come from a feeling of collegiality. The students are all in this process together, and you can talk about so many different things, certainly not all related to classrooms 
but it's that kind of vitality and conversation that a liberal education actually helps to foster. Students learn to be open to the possibility of being corrected in these conversations, to being deepened in their thought about whatever the issue is, and to be transformed, to come to a new understanding that you didn't have before. But just being in this place and with the activities that go on in the place make a difference. The advantages of a liberal education over other types of education are not always obvious to those who have not acquired a liberal education or do not understand what it is or what its benefits are. When people ask, and I bet you've heard this, what are you studying in college? And if you were to answer literature or philosophy, they will often respond, so what are you going to do with it? The implication so often is that you are spending your youth and enormous amounts of money wastefully in, prepar in preparing yourself for what seems to them to be a second-class life. Second-class life with a second-class job and income, a second-class spouse. You will raise second-class children in a second-class neighborhood. Your friend's home and its accoutrements will be second-class. You merit second-class respect, which is, of course, noticeably, noticeably better than third and fourth-class respect. These attitudes may cause, in some students who choose to pursue a liberal education, to react dismissively. Some may assume an air of arrogance, or they may become deflated. However, there are sound reasons to be self-confident and self-assured when pursuing a liberal education. Why? Going back to something I said at the beginning. Liberal education, because of the way it has an effect on one's mind, one's body, one's character, one's habits, makes one's life more free from servitude to the current dominant feelings, emotions, impulses, beliefs, and even skills that seem so important today, but they're likely to be tossed in the ash bin of history in a few years. By teaching students to become more free, enlarges their possibility, the very possibility of expanding their own human nature. Then if they study to find only a convenient niche within a culture into which they happen to be born, into a culture that seems to demand something today, the day before yesterday it was demanding something different, and the day after tomorrow they're going to demand something else always a sense that if you simply go along with the trend of things, what seems to be the trend of things, that you very likely eventually will in a sense limit yourself to a kind of obsolescence. One of the uh, really interesting characters in the 20th century died a few years ago. Very brilliant philosopher. Brilliant man. Also a bit of a uh, named Mortimer Adler, very influential educator. When he's addressing this, this issue of universities sort of trying to catch up with the very latest thing and only teaching that, he said that uh, some people, these kinds of people, just become learned in some few things, learned ignoramuses. The force of Adler's disapproval is not directed to students, but to those universities that define their educational mission by producing large numbers of narrowly specialized professionals. On the other hand, there are voices that say this is what 
always up to date and it always could change what it's doing because society is always changing. <coughs> One of these uh, proponents is William Van Til, a very influential educational guru. He considers a liberal arts education to be outmoded because he says, content we teach in American schools is not as relevant as it might be to the lives of the young people we teach. By relevant, he means learning skills that will help students get a job. That's an important thing. Higher education, he believes, should be a means of obtaining gainful employment. Teachers who do otherwise, he says, teach meaningless content. The content should be should aim at teaching students to fit into their own culture. Be better able to find a spot within it for themselves. C.S. Lewis, however, describes this type of limiting education and its relationship to liberal education in the following way. Every age has its own outlook. It is especially good at seeing certain truths and especially liable to make certain errors. All contemporary writers share to some extent the contemporary outlook. They share the same great mass of common assumptions and a characteristic blindness. Where they are true, they will give us truths which we half knew already. Where they are false, they will aggravate the error with which we are already dangerously ill. Lewis makes clear that the reason we consult the minds of the past is not because they were perfect. In truth, they were subject to their own blind spots as we are to ours. The crucial difference is that they did not have the same blind spots. Lewis's remedy for this myopia is a liberal education. Now I want to move on to my second term, literature, at least as troubling as the term liberal education. I want to tell you a story that I was uh, really a part of several years ago. I was invited to be a participant in a panel sponsored by the Seattle Public Library. It was a public event. And other panelists included English professors and English teachers. And we were all asked to address the same question. Why read? That was the title of the symposium. Each of the panelists, this was my, this, this really was an event that really surprised me because none of us shared any belief that all of the panelists had altogether different, radically different views about why people should read. In fact, as we've discovered, radically different liter ideas about what literature is. The responses panelists made to the presentation the presentations of the other panelists manifested in the main little of those behaviors Newman believed were inculcated by liberal education, equitableness, calmness, and moderation. <laughs> Instead, the public audience that day could only conclude that literature teachers could not agree about what they were supposed to teach. Perhaps they didn't even know why literature was important for students to study. One panelist argued that literature was the most effective way to enliven students' imaginations. Another argued that literature was necessary for students to become more aware as, citi as citizens. A third said literature enlarged the emotions. A fourth said the importance of literature was that it affected social change. Another that it raised the awareness of society about the condition of the disenfranchised classes. Yet another contended that literature was a powerful tool to obtain and hold and exercise political power. My own position, and I should say I did, did 
not carry the day. Nobody's did. My own position at the time was more formal and was grounded on the meaning of the word itself. I claimed that literature was basically a matter of letters. Litera means letters in Latin. An arrangement of graphic symbols that are capable of communicating ideas from one person to another. As speech communicates ideas by complex, interpretable sound patterns, literature communicates ideas by complex, interpretable graphic patterns. Students who can read and write soon learn to communicate in various literary forms and in various literary styles. And each form at its best conveys certain ideas and certain feelings in a way not precisely replicable by any other form. As an example of the two differences of two chief differences of literary form, I cited De Quincey's famous distinction between the literature of knowledge and the literature of power. For De Quincey, a cookbook, and he cites that, is an example of the literature of knowledge because it teaches readers how to do something they want to know, and this is good. The literature of power, these are fictional stories. Poems and prose fiction engage our minds, he says, and our interests in a completely different way than a how-to-do-it manual and other such works that explain how to accomplish something practical. By contrast, the literature of power are fictional stories which move our minds and evoke the emotions in another way. A further advantage of reading fiction, I said, is to illustrate principles to students that would aid them in making more sophisticated judgments about both the range and consequences of human choices and the power and beauty of these works written in various literary forms. As I said earlier, uh, nobody carried the day at that event. I want to talk about fictional stories and I want to define fiction in the way that Aristotle does in his poetics. He does something really strange. When you think poetics, you think poetry. And when you think of poetry, you've probably been taught to think of it as being different from anything written in prose. Because poetry is crafted in such a way that it has a natural musical rhythm to it. And some prose kind of approaches that. Most prose, certainly in a cookbook, wouldn't. When Aristotle defines what poetry is, he defines it in a very different way. He means anything that is fictional, anything that's fictional, as distinguished, he says, from anything that's history. History, he says, if it's going to be any good, can only deal about past events and should give an accurate account about what really happened. Fiction, what he calls poetry, fiction means stories that aren't historical. These stories can be set in the past, they can be set in the present, they can be set in the future. But why is it people are interested in stories? Why is it that children are interested in stories? It's built into human nature. Little children want to be told stories. And I'll bet most of you here have gone to a movie that you wanted to see a story performed. Fiction has its own appeal. And it's built, that appeal is built into human nature. It's something that we want for ourselves. In a recent book, Why Literature Matters, Glenn Arbery explains how fictional stories 
have the power to expand and deepen the sense for human feeling. Good readers approach literature, poetry, fiction, with a sense of mystery. Certainly, this isn't always the case. But I think the first time you, are, you become engaged in hearing a story, you really want to know what's going to happen next. You really do want to know how things end up. And some great stories, even though you know the broad outlines of the action, are worth, these are the classics, that they're worth reading over and over again because each time you discover something new and important about the story. It's like music. I'm sure all of you have had this experience with music. Some, you heard a tune, and you just couldn't hear enough of it. You'd hear it six, seven, eight times, 50, 60 times, and after a while, you just don't want to hear it anymore. It loses its power over you. And yet there are some, some works of music that you just never get tired of. You may not hear it every day, but you never want to be without it, so that someday in the future you want to hear it again. There's a special kind of music that does this, and it, just as there's classical literature, there are music classics as well. They simply never run out of their power to engage you. Literature today is very, I think, less and less taught in the way that I've been describing it. That is, literature is, underst is understood fundamentally to engage some this human capacity that we have and no other creature has it. We create these arbitrary graphic symbols, the letters of the alphabet, and we can arrange them into words that we can interpret word after word and we get ideas and they fascinate us at least a good story does it has a power that resonates with something basic to our own human nature and it's good to have that human nature fulfilled today uh, I think that uh, so very often, at least at universities, literature is taught for very different reasons. Some of the reasons are sociological, some political, some having to do with critical theory. Fortunately, that, uh, that rage, which is sort of dominated the late 80s uh, to the end of the 90s, I think it's sort of passing away. There's something about this human ability to interpret graphic symbols and understand the graphic symbol, say, as a word. There's no other creature that is able to gain an idea by a graphic symbol. And a series of graphic symbols can give us a series of interrelated ideas. This is why uh, when people ask the question, what are the most important things that distinguish human beings from any other kind of animal? You get all kinds of answers. Uh, one is that we're the only creature that can laugh at a joke. We're the only creature that can tell a joke and we respond. We, we, we are a laugh and we're capable of laughter. So many of human characteristics animals do, but there are certain others that uh, are really unique to us. Uh, there, there is no animal that can change uh, the style of, some, of one of the fine arts. Animals are genetically programmed to do their mating dances, their fertility dances, and they're gonna, as long as that species lives, they're gonna do that dance the same way. Human beings can vary their style. We have this capacity of imagination and creativity. We may be just as 
innately inclined to, to dance or to perform music or any of the other fine arts, as the animals are compelled to do these kinds of things. Birds sing after all, they create their own music, but we can create in a way that's not genetically determined. We can create new things and in new ways, and some of these are going to be interesting to other people. I want to cite a, an example of something. I was, some years ago, I was asked to give an address at, at uh, Oxford University, and, and uh, I was riding the bus to the college, and sitting on the seat next to me was this the day's issue of the Guardian newspaper, and I picked it up and was reading through. And I saw this uh, huge story. And it had to do with something you young folks know that was new to me at the time. It has to do with uh, online competitive video games. And I learned in this article that was focused on this one game that's played in Japan where online players play enormously large sums of money to compete. And there are, there's an enormous amount of money that can be won and lost in these kind of video competitions. Such games flourish because these modern forms of communication are capable of creating intensely vivid and immediate feelings, in part because they don't demand much from the complex powers of the intellect. Such activities do little to enlarge and deepen one understanding of human nature and the intricacies of social relations. Nevertheless, these video games are a story, and they invite participation in the story. And the pleasure has to be, I don't play them myself, but pleasure must be enormous if people are willing to spend risk, spending enormous amounts of money in these competitions. It's the parts, another example, of the power of a story. I think things like, and there are so many other things like it, uh, things like these high-risk video games uh, really a part of something we're all engaged in one way or another to more or less degree, mass culture. We are influenced by the culture that comes at us from all sides. And there, I, I'm not arguing that you can, you know, ought to escape from mass culture. But I think there ought to be some way in which you can control its influence over you. That you have some command or some control over it. Russell Kirk suggests three possible strategies. The deliberate revival of the concept of traditional wisdom, keeping in mind those works, those human works of the past that have, for centuries, be, been considered very wise. Second, maybe mass culture will decline because eventually people will become bored with it. Well, I, I think that uh, mass culture doesn't really work that way. Certainly we get bored by some things in our culture today, and they're going to be changed, but they're going to be replaced by something else that excites us today and will bore us tomorrow. And he gives a third possibility, and this also has happened in history too many times. Some great catastrophe occurs which teach people to distrust their own currently held I want to offer a third possibility, a third possible remedy to becoming absorbed into mass culture. Nowadays, I believe, certainly compared to some years ago, I still believe this is true. You may dispute this, and we can bring this up in discussion. Today, I think 
many parents are paying more attention to the education of their children, even in these tough economic times. In my own classes, I see more and more students who have been homeschooled or who have been educated in private schools or charter schools. Collectively, they are fine students, at least as well prepared for university studies as those who have had a typical public school education. And they add pertinent perspectives in class discussions that would not otherwise be considered. On this note of optimism, we return at last to those two discussion questions I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks. In Plato's Republic, he said that children should be told only stories authorized by the state because he knew the power of literature to influence belief and social behavior. Here is how he described the first duty of government. Our first business is to supervise the production of children's stories. Choose only those we think suitable and reject the rest. For stories mold their minds and characters, which are more important than their bodies. The greater part of the stories current today, we will have to reject. That's Plato's argument. Plato's censorship of stories by the government is, I think, less than half complete. Focusing on what, he, uh, as he does, on what is good for the state, he took no account of the human power of that love between parents and children, and children and parents. This brings us then to our two questions for our discussion. First, what stories will you want told to your children? And why did you choose them? Then secondly, we'll move on to the other question. Which stories, if any, will you not want them to know? So now the rest is up to you. I hope I've been able to convince you of a few things, but especially the power that stories have over human beings, regardless of culture, regardless of time period. It's something built into human nature. Does it make any difference what stories your children in a few years, you will want them to know? And is there any stories you will not want them to know, stories you will not want them to be told? What comes to mind? Think back at your own childhood. What kinds of stories were you especially glad, are you especially glad to remember? What impact did they have on you? I remember, what I remember most. Can you hear her back there? Good. What I remember most vividly from my childhood and from my teenage years, um, those stories that impacted me most were those where people did live within the confines of the world. You know, they 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 use their minds and their imaginations and stories of encouragement um, of all people, uh, not just one group of people, but the stories that told of other people's perspective. Um, and those are the stories that I would want that I want my kids to know. There are no stories that I can't think of any stories that I would want them not to know because. All stories affect people different ways and add to, you know, they, they add to experiences. So there, there are no stories that I want them to know. Can you uh, cite one or two stories that you, held, you hold as valuable? Can you describe them to um, us? Uh, African tales, those are some that I always remember. There are certain uh, African tales. T tell us um, one of them. The one about the one one is about a little girl. Well, no, the the snake, the snake and the turtle. No, the snake and the frog. Okay. That's one that I'll always remember. And then the Aesop's fables. I'll remember those. Those are good ones that I remember from my childhood. So what happens with the snake and the frog? I don't know those stories. So they're friends. They they're they're two they're babies, and they're friends. And then they they go home. They both go home to their mothers, and their mothers tell them 
You know what crazy? The, the snake tells the snake's mother, the snake mother tells the baby snake, you don't play with turtles? I mean, you don't play with frogs? We eat frogs. And uh, <laughs> the, the baby, the, the mother frog, um, the mother frog tells the baby frog, well, he'll eat you. Don't trust him. He'll eat you. And so they don't. They stopped, they, but they were great friends. They, they loved each other. They were great friends until their mothers put that in their mind. And they avoided each other and they stayed away from each other, but they always remembered their friendship and they missed that friendship. But that was, that was what they were taught and that's what, what they believed. But down in their hearts, they, they missed their friendship. Sure. Makes sense. It's like folks in the house from like Disney. And there's certain there's certain themes that can be told in so many different ways that they were just some essential understandings about the human condition that we want passed on. Yeah, what do you have? Yeah, I think um, in terms of fictional stories, what I most remember from my childhood, and even now, admittedly, is fairy tales, um, because fairy tales were the kind of stories we I grew up with, and especially not even just fairy stories, but fantasy in general. There's, there's a G.K. Chesterton quote I always go back to whenever someone says that fairy tales are not something that should be taught to children. Uh, fairy tales don't tell children that dragons exist. Fairy tales tell children that dragons can be killed. And How do you I know was, Chesterton? I will. But I, um, I just read. Good for you. Good so for I you. remember that. And like the Chronicles of Narnia, just learning these values of friendship and love. And, and it doesn't matter what medium so much it's presented in, as long as you understand. You know, the people like... Lewis and Chesterton, um, they, they share the, this common conviction. And, and uh, you know, Lewis read a lot of Chesterton. And they, they, they believe, you know, life is not just a bed of roses. It's, there's always going to be an engagement. There's always going to be some struggle involved. The, uh, the issue is, which side are you going to take on the struggle? With the struggle, where are you going to place yourself in the struggle, and why are you going to place yourself there? And then you have to be smart enough. You have to be strong enough in character to engage the struggle. And the idea is to is to persevere and to win. What other stories come to mind? Yes. What do you have? aren't as they just appear to be. Very, it's a very complex story, one of those famous classical stories that will always be with us, I think. What do you have? Um, as in, uh, for nonfiction, there's a Titanic in a dream. I read that when I was in the fifth or sixth grade, and that taught, that taught me that I am not above the law. Um, you remember the story? Can you tell us? Yeah, well, maybe back in the day when they were building the Titanic, they believed that nothing could sink it, that they were above God. and Or at least the laws of nature. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that taught me that I'm very small in this world, but what I can do can be really large. And the, non the fictional story for me is out of Jack McKinley, um, Robotech, um, the ability to fight for what you believe in down to the very last man. And if I believe in something and I have proof to back it up, I will stand there until the very last minute. Does it, uh, as a reader of stories like this, does it make any difference what you believe in? Well, in life, everyone's gonna have a point where they wanna stand and stand to the left or stand to the right or stand in the middle and get torn in between. And for me, I'd rather make a, an educational decision 
look at every single angle I possibly can, and either stand to the left or stand to the right, and not be ignorant and stand in the middle and just get torn. If you're that committed, do you allow yourself any chance to adjust with changing circumstances? That's, that's with science. Science allows itself to change. If there's proof and it's presented, yes. If it's by word, word of mouth and no proof, I still stand where I stand. And, and I think an implication of what you're describing, there are some people that become so convinced, so unchangeable, even if reality shows them eventually, this is not going to be a productive way to go. It's not going to be good for anybody. It's not going to be good for myself. And yet, human beings can decide, I'm going to stay right where I am, and I'm going to keep going the way I've been going. You, you, you can deny your own intellect. One more story, and then we'll move to the second. Oh, we've got two stories, then we'll move to the second question. One, two, take it. Um, so in fifth grade, I didn't really like reading. Um, I know it was a time. And so I ran across this really uh, corny series called Red Wolf. Red? And red Wolf. Wolf? No, Red Wolf, like Red Wolf. Oh, OK. And uh, it was a um, really small series, and I read the first book being in fifth grade, and they had this thing called AR points. It was the only computer would take a test and see how many AR points. And they had like 14 or 16 books in the series, and I read all of them in one year. And they're each about 200, maybe 300 pages, and I just blew through them. And I didn't read a single book all the way up to high school after that, because that was the only book that I read. <laughs> everyone's like, my parents. Oh, now you're telling us that this this book series had a real effect on you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know what I learned from it, but I loved it. And you, then, ah, there. I'm going to deal with that issue. It really is sufficient in the first instance that, just as you said, I loved it. I'm not sure why or what I got out of it, but I loved it. That's good. Let's suppose you wanted to ask yourself the question, why am I affected so positively by this work? And then you start to ask yourself the, question, the kinds of questions scholars ask. What's the power within these words that causes this reaction? And there's a good thing and a very harmful thing that can occur when you reach that point. The harmful thing is that you start to develop, and this happens to scholars, you start to get so focused on analyzing why the story has this effect, you become an analyst, and then stories don't have the power to engage you as much anymore. The trick is to let your understanding, what you come to understand about why this work is powerful, so that it actually can make your enjoyment even greater. But it's a difficult, it's a difficult uh, line to walk. Who's two? Take. Hey. That has ancient origins, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Just the thought, like, when I was younger, I always thought that was so cool that she wasn't so obsessed with the handsome prince and how fantastic he was and how rich he was. Um, I thought it was really inspiring how she saw past all of the beast and the ugly and the scary and got to see who he really was at heart. And I really learned from that by the fact that just because someone's handsome or someone's beautiful, it doesn't mean that they're truly beautiful on the inside. Like the saying, beauty's only skin deep. Eventually that will fade, and you want to make sure that you're actually in love with the person on the inside, not just the outside. And this, this has a lot to do with that passage I read from uh, Sir Richard Livingstone having to do with liberal education should aim at perfecting in a balanced way one's mind, body, and character. 
it's tricky to keep that in balance. In balance. You know, you know people who are so focused on improving mostly their own bodies. They may be weightlifters, they might go to modeling school, do something, right? Because their focus is on one part of their being. And we know other people that are so focused on their development of their character, they become almost rigid because they're neglecting the other parts of their being. And then you have those people that are so focused on learning more and more and more that they, you know, people like this, they become sort of, they're less socially adept. They, they can't relate to other people so very well. And maybe they're not giving as much attention to their bodily health. Livingstone, I think, has got a point that as we develop to keep in perspective that we don't develop ourselves because the choices are ours in an unbalanced way. To keep, to understand that we're complex beings and we have to keep all of these three parts related and perfected in a balanced way. Second question. You've already answered it. I'm gonna, maybe there'll be somebody to challenge you. Which stories will you not want your children to know? She said, there's no story I wouldn't want my children to know. Do you all share that view? I mean, I think when they're children, there are some things you maybe shouldn't expose them to right away. When they grow up, you can let them make that choice for themselves. But personally, I don't feel comfortable necessarily sharing, I don't know, a clockwork orange with my kid when they're, you know, six. Uh, when they're older, if they want to read that, if they want to make that decision, that's okay. But when kids are young, they're really easily influenced. I don't want to bring anything that might negatively in influence them until they're old enough to know the difference. So you're, you're going to exercise some care. You're going to say, you know, I'm going to teach them stories, certain kinds of stories, but I'm going to be deliberate in not teaching them or not maybe exposing them to other kinds of stories. Let's make the choice when they're older, though. When they're young. I'm going to come back to that issue because I think there is a problem even with that. But go ahead. Who, there was another hand over here I thought earlier. Back here. Um, she actually had her hand up first. Oh, did she? I missed it. Tell me. <laughs> what story won't you want your children to know? No, I just think I think on that on that point, if we're saying, um, especially since we were discussing how literature um, does affect us so much, and it, in essence, what you're saying is that it, it affects how we view our world and it affects our judgment and our choices, then not all stories are going to be beneficial or something that is um, influencing our society. Can a story be? Uh, personally harmful to know? Um, well, I think it, it also would depend on, like she said, the age and what their experiences are. Is it one story that may be beneficial mm -hmm. to one person mm -hmm. and detrimental to another, um, just depending on what their convictions or their art and tradition views would be? A predetermined view. So I, uh, tell me what you mean by predetermined views. Are you, are you saying that people can have a particular position, can take a particular position, and no story has the power to change it? Um, I think that would be possible. I, but I would also think that you're using it necessarily for a correct um, mindset Knowledge is power. Um, 
let it be in what age, because the way how I was raised when I was a child and the way how the children are raised now are totally different. How is that? How what's the difference? Um with when I was being when I was being raised, there was no such thing as Google, Yahoo, things like that. That's what I mean. The computer age has come up. It's so easy to get the information online, it's not even funny. Um so I'm Cuban and the story of me having to tell my daughter exactly how my family came from Cuba to over here because of Fidel Castro is going to be somewhat detrimental to her because I don't want her to have bad ideas of what happened in 1985 with the embargo of the explanation and everything back and forth and I don't want, I don't want her to have the idea of oh this is how my family was um, at the same time there's stories that I don't want her to know about the wars and everything like that, World War I, World War II. I mean, those are very detrimental. How people act with people, and the question is, Dad, do they really do that? And I have to sit there and be like, that's life. Yeah. And that's all I have right there. Yeah, it's really explained a, a difficult conundrum. Um, it, it's so very difficult today to be able to screen those stories that you, at least for a time, you don't want your children to know because you want them to know other things first. Ago, and I'm not saying I agree with this at all, but uh, this uh, sociologist was asked, this was a newspaper article, sociologist was, was asked, um, uh, who, who do you think created the most evil in the 20th century? And so he gave a list of people, and on that list was Walt Disney. <laughs> you know, along with Stalin, Hitler, and you know, and of course the reporter was stunned. Who doesn't like Walt Disney? And the guy explained almost exactly what you just said. If you get only these kinds, you only get one kind of story, you're gonna distort your understanding of reality. You've got to be told a lot of different stories. You, you, if you, you know, it's, it's like eating too much trans fat. You know, it's gonna, it, it's, it's gonna put you out of balance. In the back. Can I tweak uh, your second question slightly and then answer it? Like, which stories would I not want my children to see? I think I'd like to tweak the question and say, which stories would I prefer less that they read okay. more than not? And I think I would prefer to for them to not read the stories that they personally don't feel ready to experience benefit from. Um, that being said, I would not like the idea of them being completely close to experiencing stories, reading stories that other people suggest to them or even require them to read in school. Because I don't believe that any of us, no matter how hard we try to really prevent our children from experiencing bad of life and the good of life and I think it's better for their overall development to experience both and then to have as early as possible personal choice in that. Um, without that I think that um, we might lean towards an idea concept of existence being completely determined or more determined than not and I've never been Misery can't be to 
a certain extent uh, assuage and ameliorated. Mm -hmm. I like the idea that we have some control in that. And without giving people the choice to do that, I don't know how you promote either. Very good. Well said. We've got, I think, less than a half a minute before we have to end. Is that correct? Okay. But I wanted to, I wanted to at least have you uh, give a little time to any questions that I didn't make clear enough in my remarks. Yes, shoot. Not in your remarks, but when you were uh, talking to this young lady uh, about the difficulty of the situation of uh, waiting for the age of inappropriate or whatever you can call it. And so the look of that has this kind of, I don't know what that kind of is. Um, what, what comes to mind? Mm -hmm. Couple of things. Those, uh, those, those, those you know, adults. I think mostly men. Uh, adults. We we know this is a sociological problem. Uh, who are you know they're addicted like gamblers. They're addicted to pornographic stories. And does this? And, and you can be addicted to uh, stories that are very can be very well written and engaging because it has to do with the details of physical mutilation and the fun of it. Right? The idea of uh, with snuff films where you have cinemas where you have people literally, these aren't actors, these aren't stunts. All this is, of course, outlawed, but they exist. And they're powerful movies. Having somebody strapped down and they're s mutilated slowly until they die. And there are people who will pay lots of money for these films. It seems to me that there are stories that do go beyond um, what is fit for human nature. We're like we're a different kind of being. But we are capable of perverting our own nature. Make sense? I have never even thought of those stories, so they were not on my radar. Okay. <laughs> that was like, oh my word. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask one question? Sure. Yeah. Um, Jesse sure. This is why I'm excited to be, well, one of the reasons I'm excited to be. So, what do you love about it? Well, I'm excited about it because I'm going to Yeah. Let me get, be very brief. Okay. Uh, I grew up in a culture, and this was common in America. You have to understand that Chesterton was an enormously popular writer until about 19, I guess, 1955, 57. And all of a sudden, he's just off the radar. And people won't even know his name from, from about 57 until it reverses in 74. I grew up in a, I'm that old. That's obvious. I'm that old. I grew up in a kind of a Chesterton culture. Everybody knew Chesterton. No matter how much they read him, they knew who he was. 74, there was a centennial at the University of Toronto. And it was a centenary of Chesterton's birth, 100 years. And this has created a revival of interest in Chesterton, through, literally throughout the world. And uh, there is a very active American Chesterton Society um, that hosts annual meetings. And it's really, if you get a chance to ever attend one of their annual conventions, they circulate around the United States. The most interesting collection of people, of such diverse people, that you ever, young, old, with all sorts of backgrounds. And they're all in there chatting away for three whole days. It's a lot of fun. He is, he has such a clever mind, but I'm going to confess something. When, when, when I was in high school, and probably all the way to my sophomore year in college, I, I had great difficulty resonating with him because his mind was just, the way he handled ideas was really beyond what I could ha you know, easily pick up at the time. I had to grow into Chester, but he, he, he is absolutely brilliant and clever. 
uh, very, and he can be very amusing and very serious at the same time. G.K. Chesterton. You might want to look up the uh, American Chesterton Society website. The, uh, the president is one of the most engaging speakers I've ever met, Dale Alquist. If you ever get a chance to hear him, it is worth it. Thank you very much for coming today.